everyone, I'm Maria Shemkelian, Vice Chair of Pennsylvania Film Industry Association, and we have a fantastic guest today, Kevin Bernhardt. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your time, and we're looking forward to your guidance. And Kevin, you, I'm sure, know as an actor from General Hospital, but Kevin is actually an amazing screenwriter, very established one, worked with so many stars. And uh, I think the most recent films that we're going to mention, it's Medieval, that's coming out soon. And that's Echo Boomers, that I said, I, I think it's coming out uh, next week, right? Mm -hmm. It's about to come out, right? And then the one with Orlando Bloom, Smart Chase. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think I can keep on going and going, but I think we'd rather concentrate on practical advice on how to get where you are today. Hopefully, one day. <laughs> well, thank, yeah. you. thank you, Maria, for inviting me. Thank you for joining. We appreciate you joining our mission. And the first question we usually ask is, how did you get started? Well, uh, I know it's uh, not that long a show. So uh, I would say I, you know, I really, I think I got started as a screenwriter, as an actor. I, I really had wanted to be a writer and had studied lit in college. Um, but um, I found when I arrived here that I got a much easier reception uh, as an actor. I had studied acting in a couple of classes here just to really help my writing. Uh, because I think one of the fundamentals of learning to write a screenplay is also the understanding of acting and directing and all the other key jobs around it. And um, was, uh, I had, a few people who said I maybe should try it professionally and, and it went really well, very quickly. I went from uh, a few films, uh, one in Paris, another in India to uh, uh, the soap opera General Hospital. And, uh, and from that soap opera, nighttime soap opera Dynasty and stayed there for a year. And, and then I did a series of um, smaller films, but uh, always had uh, mostly the bad guy lead, things like Hellraiser and Treacherous and Top of the World and, and things like this with, uh, you know, actors you know, um, Dennis Hopper and Peter Weller and C. Thomas Howe, Adam Baldwin. And, uh, I met on the set of one of the earlier films, um, a gentleman who was a producer. And I think after partnering with him, I made about seven, eight films in a row with him and his partner. And so I think the moral of that story is, had I not been there, God knows what would have happened because just getting someone to read a screenplay, I, I knew absolutely no one. And uh, just kind of came here with my car and whatever fit in my car and uh, was staying in a very cheap motel. So, um, I got a job as a stockbroker, but that wasn't going to last because it wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, so I, I really, I feel blessed to have met that person and that led to many other offers and many other connects to people who are in the industry. And, and, you know, you just, you just keep it going as best you can and do good work. And, and usually if you're working hard and doing good work, they come back. So that's sort of how it happened in a nutshell. How did you get from writing being a passion to writing being a job that pays your bill? That well, it was that it was that it was that gentleman I met uh, a producer uh, who I'd met on the set. I was doing a film, um, and I keep in mind I hadn't written anything that was produced. I was playing um, the lead antagonist in a film. Uh, I kidnapped uh, Tia Carrere, remember from Wayne's World and in the film and. Uh, um, they were chasing me for that and, and her fiance showed up and uh, she said he hates it here. He really just wants to go back to his room and write. And he found that hilarious and read a script. And, you know, that's how it started. He, he, he immediately optioned the screenplay, um, introduced me to a few people, had the great wherewithal to get, uh, get it made and uh, several after that because he had some success with it. And so that's how it started. It started on the set. I think, you know, the moral of the story is, you know, if you, if you know someone in this business, great. But if you don't, if you get a job holding uh, a microphone, 
on a set. If you get a job as a dolly grip, whatever job, PA, whatever job, you know, get out there, get with people who are actually making films. Um, you would be surprised at who you meet and how the guy who's staying next to you in three years is directing a film or, you know, knows someone who would be really interested in, in reading your material based on what you've told them about it. So I think it's just really about, um, you, you, you're not going to probably have anybody come to you, you know, at least early on. Yeah. But eventually that that's, that's what we're trying to get. <laughs> well, eventually. Yeah. With, with this master classes. I think it says on your IMDb that you were acting so that you could pay bills while you were yeah. becoming a screenwriter. But with acting, especially with a full-time job as an actor in General Hospital, it's very time consuming. I mean, 16 hours a day, about plus minus on set. How did you find time to write? I think if you really want to write, you find time, no matter what you're doing. I used to, I mean, I may have been in that dressing room 16 hours a day, but, uh, um, I may have been on the set 16 hours a day, but, uh, you know, 15 hours of that was in the dressing room. So, you know, once you learn your lines, you had a lot of time, you know, you find, you, you make what you, you can of what you're given. And I really saw that additional time I had in that dressing room as a way to write. Uh, I think I wrote three screenplays in the two years I was on general hospital. And, um, it's just time is where you find it, you know? That, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. So you started, I assume, without an agent uh, and just with that connection that you've developed. Yes. Uh, well, I had act, I had acting agents. I had yeah. I had uh, a very uh, quite prestigious manager named Bob Lamond, mm -hmm. and I was uh, the stuff I was doing was really uh, bottom feeder <laughs> compared to uh, he had. He had Patrick Swayze and John Travolta and Mickey Rourke and just this slew of um, uh, really working actors you've known. And uh, I was sort of the new guy there. So I had a, I had a good you know, agent as uh, an actor, good manager and a good agent. But uh, he knew what I really wanted to do. And I, I would constantly badger him to get me a, a literary agent. And he didn't... Uh, he wasn't helping in that regard. He really felt like I was uh, to some degree, I think wasting my time and uh, that I should stick with what was working. And um, we disagreed on that front and- uh, And you were right. <laughs> no, I don't know. You never know who was right. I, God, knows what, God knows what would have happened if I'd stuck with the other path, but that's okay. I, I chose this path and you know, I'm happy I did. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure I would have been happy with whatever came from the other as well. Um, because I just think you, you have to find happiness in whatever you choose, whatever choices you make and make the most of it. But yeah, uh, the agents started coming at, actually after I had uh, a couple of films made. Um, they started showing up on the set, mm -hmm. which was uh, a little bit strange for me because as an actor, I'd had to chase agents. I'd had to, um, I had to uh, impress them in workshops and things like that. And as a writer, you know, once the script gets around, it, it does its own talking. It's not you. And I, I really like that. You know, there's no, there's really, um, you know, you don't have to go and do the song and dance. It doesn't matter how well you perform in a room if your script doesn't, uh, doesn't impress them. They're not going to, uh, they're not going to get behind it. You know, it's, it's really about that, that product. So you suggest uh, for those who are just starting out to first develop a connection, try to sell something through that connection and then already consider agents. Or do you think that uh, just official, you know, sending out scripts, trying to get someone interested is a good way to go. What do you think right now, looking back at your path is the right way? I think, you know, right now, all of the above. I think things are very different now than they were when I started this in the early nineties, which was, you know, 30 years ago. Um, you can, you can make a movie now on this. I mean, it, it's insane. And um, with a group of your friends from the class and acting that you're taking in order to become a better writer or people who, you know, who just, you know, they have some uh, ability that you, 
can pinpoint that would make them great for your story. I think, you know, getting out there, uh, working for anyone, you know, uh, offering your services to anyone, you know, uh, on any level who is actually making a film or TV series or show or movie. Um, and at the same time, developing your, while you're writing your screenplay, shooting things, depending on whether you want to be a director. If you don't want to be a director, you can certainly find somebody who does and they will partner up with you. You can have um, just, there's no way to have too many friends who, who like to do what you like to do. This is a collaborative effort in every way. So, I mean, we live in a world now where you could shoot something on that phone and it, it, you could really sell it to some of the uh, streamers. I mean, they're, they're out there. You, could, you can enter it in festivals and get notice. Uh, if it's good, people will see it. And if it's not, you have become a little bit better and you actually have uh, something that you can show agents. Uh, it, I'll tell you, it'll be much easier to get a, an agent to watch a trailer for a film you had the wherewithal to go make and you can, they may never watch the film, but if you make the trailer, you know, interesting enough, um, you may get them to read your screenplay. You could go and shoot a trailer without shooting the film and, and you will probably get more people willing to watch that. Um, it's all about promotion now, put it on YouTube. You know, you, you just never know. There's so many ways now to reach these people that uh, didn't exist. Uh, years back, it was, it was really difficult um, to get someone to sit down and read a script for an unproduced writer uh, back in the day. It's still difficult, but you have tools to promote your work that I did not have. And I use them now, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, this is the way to do it. Now, getting an agent is not the solution to your, to your problems. Most people think, oh, if I get this big agent, and same goes with acting. Every writer I know, every actor I know gets four to five, gets four out of five or nine out of 10 of their own jobs. Sure. Work begets work. If you think an agent, an agent can submit you, but I will tell you, if you don't get a job relatively soon, especially if you're new, um, they're gonna stop and you're gonna be looking for a new agent. You could spend the rest of your life doing that. Um, you, your screenplay, they, they'll send it to a dozen producers. If they get passes from all of them, as much as you love it, they're probably not going to promote it, even though there's, you know, 48 more people who could read that screenplay out there. Producers, they're going to stop. A lot of this is promoting yourself. A lot of this is really learning how to do that. It's, it's uh, all of the above. You know, you have to see uh, the business side of this as well. It is, it is only half about being an artist. You really have to do a lot of this yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to keep accurate records of every person you've ever met. Um, someday you will have something for that person. And, you know, it may be three years later. And if you can recall who they were, that's a much easier way to get a response. Yeah. I met you here with this person. Oh, and I have this story. Oh, if you just go to someone out of the blue, I, I think you'd be great to produce this. I think you'd be great to be my agent. Why? Uh, you, nobody I know knows you. And then you look at the list of emails they have that day from people just like you. And you understand why just on a business level, they just don't have time to respond to you or to any of them. It's just uh, impossible. So it's not rudeness. It's just that, you know, they would love to find someone to help them make more money. But uh, there's just a certain uh, reality to how many people they can represent, you know, Um so that's just one of your tools. I mean, there's so many different ways to do it, but you know, there's no better tool than just getting out there and doing it, getting on a set and working with your screenplay in your trunk, getting, uh, getting your friends together and shooting, a, uh, uh, what's called a sizzle reel, some, some version of your story that people can actually watch. It's so much easier to get someone, people are generally, you know, I wouldn't say lazy, but they read a lot of screenplays that they have to read. So when you put yours in front of them, it's like yeah. uh, the pile just got deeper. And why am I reading? So if you can say, hey, this is three minutes long. It's so great, my friend. They'll watch it, you know? And, and if you can pique their interest with that, they'll read the screenplay. Another way to do it if you don't want to shoot it is, you know, make yourself uh, a deck. A deck is, you know, 20 to 25 page document using, um, you could use pages, you can use other for, uh, software, but you create something which 
says, this is the title of my story. Uh, this is who I am very, very briefly. Um, my, my story is a cross between these movies that you already know. Um, this is the two lines or three lines about it. And this is the two or three pages, you know, the treatment, which will tell you my whole story. If you've, if you've been interested to read this far, uh, these are short descriptions of each of the main characters. These are pictures of people who could play them. These are some pictures of the world. And with that in hand, um, that has become something of a shortcut to getting people to read your screenplay as well, you know. And if you don't have the time to do one of these things, they are going to say to you, look, if you don't care enough about your story, why should I care enough to read it? You know, it's, it's really, it really comes down to that. You know, so, I mean, you really have to love what, you, what you're doing and what you've done and, and you put the, put the time that's necessary into creating something that will generate their interest, you know? Yeah. And uh, which questions should you ask when you're trying to get there, when you're already maybe at the interview with a literary agent, how do you choose the right, not them choosing you, but at this point, how do you also choose the right one for yourself? Well, um, for me, it, it's really about uh, their talent stable. I, I, I generally won't sign with uh, anyone unless I, I see the actors and directors they represent. And I know that I have um, limited, but I have some access to those people because it's all about the package now. In the 90s, it was really... You know, you could sell a spec script, you could write a great script and somebody would read that and just pay you. Um, that happens, but uh, not like it used to. It rarely happens compared to uh, the 90s. Now, most producers are looking for things that are in various stages of, um, I would say, closer to being put together. And they like that you've done a little bit of the work yourself. And um, having that access to a really solid director or an actor, um, even a great DP, some piece that has added value to your project will, will turn their head quicker. So that's what I, I look for in them. I don't look as much, I used to look for the one who had sold the most scripts last week, you know, but that, that doesn't really apply anymore because they don't have to buy them. They can option them. And I'm not looking for option money because it's, it's very little money and they, and they have your script tied up for, you know, sometimes three years. And if they just lose interest, it sits on a shelf and you really can't do anything with it. So I don't, I don't like to option material unless it's a really prestigious um, yeah. producer who, who uh, is going to be very active and, and has the connect direct connects with talent that, uh, they could get it made, you know, because that's really what it comes down to. If you want to get a film financed is uh, the talent. Mm -hmm. You can have the greatest script in the world, but uh, if you don't have an actor attached who means something uh, or a director who can get that actor, you know, that, that's never getting financed, you know, uh, not on any level that, you know, is, is above a few hundred thousand dollars generally. Yeah. Do you think that uh, screenwriters should stick to one genre when they're writing or should they just write whatever they're inspired by? I, About whatever they're inspired by. I mean, I think you, you have to. Um, I would not do that. If I was a, a beginning screenwriter, I would be thinking about the business aspect of this as well. Mm -hmm. um, you have to create inventory for yourself because you may write a great um, thriller about uh, somebody kidnapping somebody's son. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people will like that, but they won't hire you. They will like it as a sample. And that happens a lot because, you know, it's a very particular thing finding the screenplay that a producer is going to center his whole world, his office's whole world, his financing's whole world around for a year or two or three. It's a very particular thing. He might appreciate you as a writer, but just not be attracted to making that sort of film. But when you have that meeting with him, you have to find a way to make it important and valuable. You have to give him something that he does want. And if you have written 
a love story, a horror film, a thriller. If you have written a period piece, if you have written a sci-fi sci film, uh, it's it's always better to have something of a library of of these projects because you will ask him, well, you know, this isn't what you're looking for, but I'm clearly here because you appreciate the, the writing. Um, what do you have in mind? What is it that you, and he will tell you, well, I, I really would like to, well, I have money right now and it can be just as specific as I have money right now in uh, Arabia. I have money in Arabia and I'm looking to do some sort of action film there. I have one. Yeah. And when you've done this as long as I have, you have everything. You have something to replace the one he did not want. And more times than not, the one they originally read is not the one they get behind. It's the one they have specifically, now that you have had entrance into their inner sanctum, the one, and you'd have the knowledge of what they specifically really like uh, beyond what they've made. Um, now you have that inside information. With inside information, oh boy. Okay, you want a comedy, a dark comedy. I have one. What? Yeah. And you may have written it 15 years ago, but yeah, I just finished it three weeks ago. This is crazy. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Uh, serendipity. Oh my gosh. Uh, that is why you write different genres. That's one reason on the business side. The other reason is, I mean, screenplays all have the successful films in our history all have a story structure that has come down from Joseph Campbell and others for uh, thousands of years. It, it is what works. And if you look at almost every successful film, it has a skeleton built in underneath that is the same. It doesn't matter if it's sci-fi, it doesn't matter if it's a love story that can be meteors crashing on earth, aliens. It can be a Western about somebody stealing cattle. It, it doesn't matter what it is. They all turn on the same axis. If you can learn to put all different kinds of stories around that same structure, they help each other. It will re really expand your mind and help you to find elaborate solutions to almost any story that you can come up with. And the best exercise is always, you know, it's like anything, even sports, you know, you, you, you don't just uh, practice the same move until you become the best of it. You have to become the best screenwriter, not the best horror film writer. And in fact, you'll probably, if you try and do that, you, you'll end up uh, somebody who gets a few horror films made and then, and then you'll want to write a, a beautiful love story and nobody will read it because they'll say, oh, you're that guy who only writes horror films. So I, I think probably a writer has to be capable of, of uh, just finding, um, you could specialize, but just finding the heart of uh, a screenplay in any genre. So I, I would not recommend just writing one genre. If you really love it, that's the one you should do first. But I, I promise you if, you, if you write a horror film first and you think it's great, go and write a love story and then look at your horror film when you're finished finished you'll end up rewriting it I, I promise you you will because you your mind is now sort of um open to uh, a different path toward the same end you know so that would be my advice mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you that 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 is fantastic practical advice to be prepared for these pitching meetings yes. yeah i mean it's it's li listen um if you're an actor, you were an actress, correct? Um, if you go in and they say, oh, wow, we really, we really love you, but uh, it's too bad you can't do comedy because we've got this other. Now, if you also studied comedy and you worked on comedy, you can say, well, I went to this school and I also can dance. I can play uh, the guitar. You know, these, these types of, uh, this, this work not only impresses them, that you really believe enough in yourself that you have um, reached out and tried to be better in so many ways, um, knowing that each of these skills uh, sort of contributes to the other and helps you become a, a better overall artist. 
they they want to work with you. They want to find ways to work with you. You're serious about this. You're not just someone who's you know there on a whim. You know, somebody told me I should. You know, it's not that. You you really are taking this seriously because look, by the time they get to casting, so much has happened with that script and that director and getting the money and the other actors, they're not gonna, they generally will on a professional production, they're not gonna risk it on someone who's not just as serious about this, all the way down to the person who has three lines. They have to be as serious about this as they are. You know, uh, I've been on all these sets, you know, there's nothing worse than the guy who has three lines, who can't do it. He, he's not just a, he, you know, his friend told him he should act and this is his first job. And he just can't do it. And, and you know what, it's going to end up cut or they're going to take one of the, uh, they're going to take the gaffer and they're going to throw him in there. And, you know, yeah. you have to be as serious about this as you want them to take you. Right. You know, if, if you're not serious, why the hell should they be serious about you? You know, if you, if you, if you don't have the screenplay that you absolutely know is the best foot forward that you can provide to them why should you expect them to take two hours or three out of their day and read that you know yeah. if you ever have to start a letter with dear sir uh, please forgive the typos and i'm sorry the script's so long but if i'd had more time don't send it don't send it no matter what they say yeah, send it anyway that relationship's ruined um fix it it's what you do if you really want to do this you do it if you don't there's, there's plenty of other jobs, you know, you can do. Um, and you better love this if you're going to do it. Right. Yeah. And every relationship is golden because like you said, everybody can connect you to someone. You lose one relationship, you lost a huge opportunity. Exactly. You don't know what else they're doing. You don't know who they know. You don't know, uh, just how hard these connections are to make until you don't have them because there will be slow times just like there are busy times. And in the slow times, you'll think, oh my gosh, if I just, you know, um, I need to do something to create work for myself, but I didn't, I didn't keep track of the people I met. I didn't take the cards of the people who uh, offered them to me. I didn't, I didn't take that lunch that I could have taken while I was working on that set. I didn't do, um, I didn't take the meeting with the agent that my friend told me I should you know, or I did, but I can't remember his name, you know, this sort of thing. I can't, it's really, it's really important. Treat it like a business. You, you can't just, writing, this isn't an end in itself, you know, this isn't like writing books. Even that has a certain business aspect to it, but uh, filmmaking, you, you're just part of it. You're a cog in the wheel, you know, you're the first cog, but you're a cog in the wheel, you know, it's so collaborative. So you need to know, different people who you've met over the years who have a different perspective of you and your work mm -hmm. because you can always uh, reach out to them and remind them, um, you know, I heard you were looking for something like this. Is this true? I met you in, uh, in the office about this project three years ago. And, and generally they'll respond a lot quicker than if you just send them an email with some address you pulled off of IMDb and you know it, it's dear sir uh, I think you really like my screenplay will you please read it guess what I'm gonna read your screenplay you know so it, it's it's you really have to keep an eye on the business side of it mm -hmm. when you put yourself in that frame of mind there's a lot of minds that you're putting yourself into and that all gets emotional because you're going through a lot of emotions with your characters. How do you keep yourself balanced emotionally when writing such scenes a lot? I don't. Okay. I don't. I don't. I, don't. I, 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 try to, I try to feel everything. If I'm not feeling anything, why would I ever expect, you know, it's got to be on the page. And if, if, I'm not, if I'm not feeling it while I'm writing it for the first time, then, you know, how is anyone reading it going to feel anything? Uh, you really have to um, use yourself as a barometer. And uh, I mean, I have written things that have really, you know, stirred up feelings. And, uh, you know, sometimes when you're writing something, you, you have to find the feeling in yourself um, to, 
to some degree instigate taking the character further than you might normally go. You know, what would I do if this happened? I mean, uh, and, uh, and how far could I go with that? And you might have to pull it back. But again, this is stuff I learned by being an actor that, you know, a lot of writers, I think to some degree, um, I've had quite a lot of films produced because I, I write for uh, not specific actors, but I write for actors. I write these roles so that these actors can really they can really uh, read and respond to that emotion that is there that has taken that character as far as possible. And, you know, they can see it, you know, they can feel it. And uh, even more so than most producers or anyone else in their office who would read the script, the actors can, you know, they can really feel what the potential of those words are and what the potential of uh, the uh, reading be between the lines is as well. You know, and there's a lot of that that you try to create to some degree. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't hold back any emotions. I love, I love if I'm feeling something while I'm, while I'm uh, writing it, I, I think I'm on the right track. Mm -hmm. You know, it would get very boring for me if I didn't. <laughs> emotions also can be difficult to handle when rejection is coming in and that happens in the beginning I'm sure a lot uh, until you already get established so how did you deal with rejection emotionally at the beginning of your path uh, I get rejected today I mean everyone gets yeah. rejected you, you have to keep I, it's it's harder at the beginning yeah because for a number of reasons you you don't realize that even even the the best um, screenwriters, directors, actors are getting rejected every day. It's just a different level of rejection, uh, but you're still getting rejected. Rejection um, is, for me, um, it just means uh, the material wasn't the right fit for that person. I don't take it personally. I, I just understand that for whatever reason, it didn't resonate with them and you can never know why you can speculate it until you're dead why it didn't but um as long as i know i have really done my best possible work and put my best foot forward um rejection just means pick up the phone and call three more people i mean there are a lot of producers out there and there is a lot of money and there's a lot of especially now different platforms who are buying all levels of uh films less so the the bigger budget because of the theater problem but uh that will change too so um i think probably the way to deal with rejection is just not to take it personally i think you should see rejection as like any other failure something that the average person would call a failure in life just see it as part of the bigger picture and a learning experience you know what could i have done differently did they offer any notes? A lot of times those notes aren't, you know, their, their opinion on the script is just an excuse to get out of something because they really don't have the funding anymore that they said they had, or they can't get to that actor they said they could get to, or they are uh, about to get divorced and don't want to make any more movies. Uh, you know, there could be any reason that they have rejected you. They could have rejected every script that's been sent to them in the last, you know, since their problem started a year ago. Or maybe they want to do a different kind of film. Maybe they've decided they only want to do, you know, horror. You don't know. As long as you put your best work on their desk, and rejection is nothing. It's just mm -hmm. the only thing I could take from it is, do they have any valid critique? If, if they want to show you the coverage they've done, uh, is there something in there? And I'm very open-minded. I'll take notes from anyone, anyone, um, doesn't matter. Um, if I see something that makes sense, um, I'll fig I'll rewrite the script. I'm constantly rewriting scripts. I rewrote a script. Uh, I rewrote a script uh, a few months ago that I'd written 20 years ago. You, you, you sit down in between your actual writing assignments and you improve your inventory. You never stop. You never stop writing. You, you only make things uh, better and more attractive uh, to the current climate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so there is no, there is no rejection. There's just 
you know, you asked the girl to dance. You didn't know that she'd fallen in love with your best friend yesterday. And she said, no, oh my God. She said no to me. What's wrong with me? Nothing. Yeah. You know, find another girl who hasn't fallen in love. It, it's, it's not, it's not, and that rejection has nothing to do with you. It really doesn't. You know, I, I think I learned that as an actor when you would audition mm -hmm. and you wouldn't get the part. And for some strange reason, despite the fact that they had seen 400 people for the same role, you had in your mind that you were the obvious choice. And then you leave and can't believe it. That they're so crazy that you weren't chosen. How is this possible? Are they out of their mind? No, you're two inches too tall. You're two inches too short. They want a blue eyes. You don't know. You'll never know. So part of the job of writing and acting is to put yourself on the stage and audition. That's part of the job. You're not just being paid and employed to actually deliver something that's shooting. You're being paid for that time too. So you have to look at that time as a great learning experience and a great opportunity to showcase yourself. Because if I told you the number of people who rejected a screenplay, but called me with a job three years later, or called and said, what happened to that screenplay? I want it now. Now I'm in a position to make it. And then I heard the truth. Or the directors who auditioned me as an actor and, and cast me three years later without an audition because I they knew what they had seen me do in the previous audition that I thought I was terrible. And that's why they hated me and didn't want me. And then here they are calling saying, no, you're, you're going to play it's, it's really out of your control. It's nothing you can possibly know. You do your best work. You take what you can. And that's, that's part of the job. Rejection is going to happen to you. It's going to happen to you when you have an Academy Award. So, you know, get used to it. <laughs>
head straight for the ending. And you should know what your ending is before you write one word. And it may change, but not usually. Mm-hmm. You know, because you know what you want to say. And uh, your way of saying it may change, but you're probably going to say the same thing if it's clear in your mind. So, you know, that usually gets rid of any sort of insecurities about um, about uh, anything uh, along the path. You know, the only time I get really uh, shooken up is when I, I really realize that um, something I've chosen to say isn't really it's not relevant. It's taken me too long to write it. Cause I go back and forth to these things in between jobs yeah. and uh, the relevance is kind of gone because everything changes so quickly now. And so I almost have to throw, I, I never, I never think it's going to happen, but I al- almost have to throw the script away and start over because it's, it's just become irrelevant. And, and maybe I could write a decent version of what I was already, but I, I don't, I'm not looking for decent. It's gotta be the best I can write. Because again, if it's not my best, how can I expect anybody else's best? Or how can I expect to get the best director possible or the best actors? Mm-hmm. You can't. So, you know, and you, you really have to, um, if it's not, if it's really important to you, you won't be, you won't be in any way nervous or uh, doubtful about where you're going. Once you've made the decision, make the decision before you go. And, and, and you will be, you know, on the right road to something good, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At least not, inse- you may be on the wrong road, but at least you won't be insecure on the trip. <laughs> <laughs> when you're writing, do you already have some actors in mind? Uh, or do you have some other way of visualizing your characters? How do you usually uh, put together a character list in your head? Uh, never actors in mind. I don't, uh, you know, I, I feel like, uh, I mean, I guess the answer to that for me is, you know, I, I don't feel like I, I don't know actors. So I know a lot of actors, but I, I don't know um, if I'm writing a story. I, I, you know, I don't know the personal lives of the actors I'm, picturing and roles well enough to create a fully fleshed out character. I would only be going by uh, roles I'd seen them playing. So I'd really be um, creating something that was pretty one dimensional um, because it's, it's really just derivative of those other roles. And it would never, I think it would rarely appeal to that actor anyway because they're going to see it as something they played so many times before and not be attracted to it you know actors want to play you know different characters that you know they can inspire them and and really help them to find some nuance and character that they haven't um, played before so typically I will look to um, friends and family um, maybe great characters in literature um, but uh, never to uh, actors. You know, if you do that, you also create a sort of very limited character, I think, in the sense that, you know, how many people can play it if it's very specifically written for that guy? You know, uh, I think to some degree that's limiting. And I, and I also think, you know, character is a form, it's, it's a function of plot. You know, you really, once you know your theme, a character has to carry that forward. And if you're, if you're spending your time um, putting a lot of meat on the bone, that's just derivative of other characters that this actor has played. It's sort of a waste of breath. It's not getting you closer to um, the heart of the matter. And then that's going to interfere with all the other characters because their job is to push or pull your lead character um, to his ultimate self in the end. So I know I don't do that. Okay. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> but, but that's a very interesting explanation for why. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't recommend that. I think you're, I think a lot of people do that, but now you're gonna, you're also gonna look like a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Script's gonna look like a lot of other people's script, yeah. you know. Um, I think stories can be inspired by other movies, but I think characters should not you know they should i'd rather see a character about your grandma <laughs> and i would uh than i would uh some um 
mature lady in a film. I, 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 you know, I've seen that lady playing that part already. Yeah. I've seen that actress playing that part. Why do I want to watch that again? Yeah, that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Now with the dialogues, you want them to sound realistic, but you also want them to be artistic, unique, sometimes magical, depending on what the screenwriter is working on. So that, how do you keep that balance in the dialogue? Well, I think things start sounding very uh, real life and very sort of passerby, very typical when you've forgotten what the goal of that scene is. You know, if, if it ever sounds like that, then you've forgotten what these people want. Mm -hmm. You've forgotten what they want from each other. You've forgotten what they want, period. You've forgotten um, who they are. If they don't have more personality than that, you really have to... Um, you really have to keep your eye on the, the theme and uh, understand for better or worse where your characters are going. And a great sort of tool um, that will probably help you is to create uh, conflict because you know the greatest scenes come from conflict. One person wants one thing and someone else wants another and a third one enters the room and, and is on the side of one or the other, but for his own reasons. Now you have not only personality, but you have conflict. And, and that's, that's uh, you know, that's something that's interesting to an audience because we all naturally tend toward resolution. We want to see, even if we see a couple arguing in a diner, we want them to work it out. We, you know, we want things worked out. We, we want equal rights. You know, we want things to be uh, to some degree uh, calm for every thing and everyone around them. It's, it's sort of, I think, a human trait to, you know, we, we operate best uh, with a, I don't know, a vibration that's peaceful, you know? And so if you create that conflict, as much as it may go against your own psyche and how much you don't like it, if you create it in your characters, people are really, you know, looking forward to where you're taking them. And um, especially if you've created very intriguing uh stories for each of the characters. So you're interested to see who changes or what they do as a result of what they believe, who wins, who loses, do they find the middle ground? That is what creates typically, a, a, you know, one of the things which creates uh, interesting dialogue. It's, a, it's probably the easiest, probably the easiest place to, to go if you're feeling like your dialogue is stagnant, mm -hmm. you know, just go, go to a place of what are the differences between these people who are in this scene and, you know, why aren't they more aggressive about what they want? Even if they're not saying it, they it could be doing things that incite the other characters to action or words. So, um, you know, if you keep your eye on that and you keep your eye on where everyone's going, um, and that's the same whether whether they're chasing a kidnapped child, a stolen diamond, or uh, just trying to fix a broken relationship. You know, it, it's really just about two, at least two different people, usually, um, wanting something different, you know, based on who they are. And uh, both trying to find resolution. And then you determine how they want to find resolution. Do uh, is one of them more violent? Is the other going to go to tears? Um, are they going to offer a, a bargain exchange? You know, there's, there's, you know, uh, you you've had all these experiences in your life. You know, uh, that's what that's what people want to see. Nobody wants to see passerby dialogue that they could hear uh, on the street corner or they could hear um, at the restaurant or grandma's house. N nobody wants to hear this. They don't go to the movies or pay or, or sit still long enough to watch that. So, you know, if you if you can go through your screenplay and you can pull out a page and everything makes sense after that page, you did something wrong. Take the page out. Nice. It, you know, you can't have that kind of dialogue. You can't, unless there's something so much more going on underneath it. You know, uh, a boy who is impossibly in love with a girl he knows he can never get is talking about the weather. Okay, well, that's, that's conflict. That's inner conflict. That gets into another thing. 
and you know she's seeing it and she's conflicted about how to tell him um that it could happen mm. because she's not sure that, that what she's seeing is the right the right thing so you know it's it's really once you once you are writing a scene and you and you put yourself in that frame of mind for those characters dialogue should be fun you know it should be something that you enjoy writing you know when you're not at the uh, filming stage yet and you are still correcting the script when do you know that it's enough when do you know that now it's the best version of it and also how do you accept feedback when do you know when to listen to it and when not to listen considering how subjective this field is well uh you have to listen to all the feedback if you're actually in in development and pre-production with with the director with the producer you know all, all the feedback is important mm -hmm. um and they determine when enough is enough um they will give you notes which have reasons ranging from um, we're hiring. Um, uh, we've got we've gotten this actor, this name actor, so you have to increase the size of his role. Mm -hmm. Great, fine, but it's difficult because you have to keep it within the parameters of a story that you know is still serving the narrative. It's not just uh, fluff that's going to end up cut by the editor anyway. There's there's no there's no real gain in that. Uh, as far as um, when to accept notes before all this happens, mm -hmm. yeah, unless someone's paying you, you don't you don't accept notes. You, you have done your best, and you 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 should be able to defend yourself. And they will actually um, respect you more if they say to you, um, "This is how you should change it," or "These are my notes for how it would be better." Uh, if you are someone who says, great, thank you, you can do that. Um, you'll probably get further if you risk being non-confrontational, non but uh, supportive of your script and say, really, because, you know, what I was really trying to do is, and the way I did it was, you know, so that's why you read. And I see your point, but that would make it, and I could take it this way, but understand that if I do, this changes. If you have an intelligent um, and hopefully um, enlightening conversation with him, he will, you know, it's, it's really an exercise that allows you to flex your muscles a little bit as a writer with him so he can come to appreciate that you, you didn't write this, you know, on a whim at your grandma's house in a week. This, this is something that a lot of hard work went into and you really believe in it and you really uh, can support it um, structurally and uh, emotionally and in a way that um, is relevant to what's happening in the world today. You know, if you've taken all these factors into account when you've written this and, and you can then um, have an intelligent discussion again not this is not confrontational if he begins to get confrontational uh, you know stop talking right. just it, it's not going to you know serve you in any way but if you can have an intelligent discussion which you can most of the time they will come to respect you and probably want to see you again if you just lay down and say yeah yeah, yeah you're right you're right be prepared to make those changes because if you really believe him he may see you in a year and say hey did you do all that and of course you didn't because you don't believe in what he said right so <laughs> what's the point of agreeing um now he may be right if he's right you have another opportunity once again it's about the opportunity it's not only about getting in the producer's door and saying, but what do you really want to make? Because I have that in my trunk. It's about saying, well, uh, these are great notes. Would you, would you read this again once I do that rewrite based on your great notes? He'll probably say yes. If you really want to, if you really like what he's saying, do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, he will probably tell you the truth. Well, it's not really for me. 
because I'm looking to do more of a uh, Alice in Wonderland type film right now, something fantasy. You'll get the truth. And from that, you can take, uh, you were never going to, you were never going to make my uh, love story set in Japan because that's just not what he has in his head right now. Uh, a lot of times, the more questions you ask, the more you'll, you'll get the truth. But yeah, I mean, that's how you should look at your notes. And, and you're going to have a number of people reading your screenplay. And if you're getting the same notes from everyone, that, then it's maybe time to pay attention. But, it, but just, just, just if you're getting varying notes um, from different people, and these are not your relatives who love you and are going to tell you it's, you know, it's a masterpiece, regardless of what they're saying when you're not around. These are, you know, people who will tell you the hard truth um, to them just know that that's their truth. And it's the same as getting rejection from um, someone who may buy it. You can't, unless it makes sense to you, it should go in one ear and out the other. You really, if you can support what you've done, it's the natural inclination of people when they're given a script to feel like they were given it to fix it for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is not really what you want you want them to help you right. so when they come back with their ideas about how to improve this or make it better I, you know if you hear the same note from several people take a hard look at it and maybe you'll get a better response if you spend the time changing it you know it's 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 more valuable much more valuable when you're starting out to be able to learn from these people who are giving you this critique especially if it's consistent and being able to apply that uh to your material that critique is much more valuable than a pat on the back and this is going to be the greatest film ever that is like that should be as much as we don't want it to be that should go in one ear and out the other too um if you're going to ignore the negativity, unless it's valuable to the story that you know so well, you have to ignore the positivity. If they're not buying it or making it, you know, take that to, uh, I want you to take that uh, to Trader Joe's or Ralph's, take that positivity, take that great uh, email you got from them and try and buy some groceries with it. It's, it's unless they're buying it or paying you, it's smoke. Yeah. means nothing. If they're not buying it, they're just getting rid of you. Yeah. You know, scripts are a way to either get in the door and sell them the other script you have that they really want or a way to collect some possibly helpful notes on how to make this material that is so close to you better. Mm -hmm. And you should welcome that. You should welcome the negative Oh, this thing, it just moves way too slow. Really? And that's what somebody else said. I wonder why. Take a hard look at the skeleton underneath. Oh, here's what I did wrong. You know, sometimes it's very simple. Other times it's it's more about, I didn't really like your lead character. Why not? Well, he was this, that, he was the other. She did this and said that. Okay. Well, I heard that also from uh, someone else who I you know respect who tells me the truth. Uh, take a look at it. You know, some of this stuff bears examination. And... Um, you know, you're the one who ends up with the product that is closer to something that will appeal to people. Mm -hmm. And they helped you, even if they're criticizing you in some way, they have helped you. So, you know, the, the, the criticism is more valuable than the, uh, oh, I love this part. And oh, when he said this and uh, that action scene, that, that's like, okay, well, I mean, I kind of knew that I wrote it and I gave it to you because I thought it was great. <laughs> I mean, I, you don't really need that. It means nothing. It's great. It's nice. It's nice because they feel like you need that. Uh, yeah. You know, when you get older, like me, it just, um, are you going to make it? Mm -hmm. If you're not going to make it, can you point me in the direction of somebody who might want to make this? And what are you, are you looking for and what did you what did you not like about it I, I know you loved it what did you not like well I didn't like that um 
I've lost my funding in India and you said in India. It's as simple as that. Like you don't know a lot of times what the underlying reason is. It could be completely irrelevant to your story. You just you can't take it personal. And you've mentioned perspectives. There are different perspectives. And now here is your baby, your script that you think is the perfect version of it that you could possibly come up with. Right. You get to the director and the you, director says, oh, here's how I see it. And you're like, ah, 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 that is not how I wrote it. But you know that the director is running that world on set right now and you don't want to ruin that relationship. How tough is that? And how do you deal with that? Sometimes it's very, sometimes it's the yeah. toughest thing, but you do it. You find what I do is I usually try my best to figure out. Uh, I, I don't focus on their suggestions for what should be in there. I focus on why they would want it changed. Mm -hmm. And I try to come up with better options than a lot of them usually have. Some are very brilliant as writers and I'm lucky to have worked with them. Others, uh, no, uh, you just have to, <laughs> you really have to just um, figure out um, why he wants to add a scene here and there that have to do with, you know, maybe there's just, maybe it's something as simple as he doesn't feel there's enough action in it. Maybe he wants more of a love story. And then you can present him with options while um, really trying your best to make what he wants work. Uh, director is ultimately the uh, last word when it comes to uh, you know shooting the director and the producer. Um, and uh, the producer becomes the last word typically uh, once the film is shot. But before that, they don't want to lose the director. So they have to give him to some degree what he wants. No, you don't, you don't want a, you don't want someone directing angry. You don't want someone who is, you know, needs the job. The writer won't change this. I can't believe it. It's, you know, I have to, you know, does anyone do anything well, uh, by force or angrily, this is not something that is conducive to a good result for anyone. So you, you really wanna find a way, no matter how difficult someone is on that level to be collaborative. Yeah. And that's with the films that don't have a lot of money to uh, develop the screenplay further. The ones who do have money, if you don't find some way to make it work with the director, they just replace you. You just get another writer to, to, to do it with your script. And they have every right to do that. You, you have no choice. Yeah, yeah. If you refuse or you just can't provide what they want, they, they will find someone who, who will, you know, or the director will do it himself. Now, the top one. Three mistakes, maybe, that you've made, or lessons that you've learned along the way that you can now tell those who are at the beginning of the path to not do, <laughs> or maybe do. <laughs> I only get three. You can, I, you, can, <laughs> you can share more. I think... Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I mean, I think you can't make enough mistakes. But I think when you start making them repeatedly, <laughs> the same ones, <laughs> then, you, then you probably... Uh, you know, life is a learning experience. If I was going to uh, narrow this down, um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say um, there are many mistakes on a creative level because you know what's right for you when you choose it is right for you all the way to the end and, and you chose it for a reason and it's it's right out of your brain and and out of your life and your experience and the people you've known and god knows how many other lifetimes who knows but on a business level um be very careful um who you attach to your project mm -hmm. very careful who you let in your circle of those who will uh, help you to shepherd your material forward, whether that's a, um, well, financier or a producer, because if they don't um, actually move the project forward in some way by attaching talent, by helping you to find the financing, you, can attach someone who remains attached 
because you have made this desperate decision that anyone is better than no one. And at least he's going to try. Well, he may not try. And then when you try to get another producer who will try and you get the interest of another producer who is going to try, he will say to you, why is my name going to be with that guy who is not doing anything? I'm not interested until you get rid of him. It is much harder to get rid of someone than it is to get them, typically. As hard as you and your imagination can come up with finding a reputable producer who's going to run with your project and get it financed and find the talent and help you with all these things. As hard as that seems to you, try to get rid of him when he doesn't. He won't go away. So you need to find a way to try with him and give him a respectful opportunity to do something but also to, as they say, cut bait. You, you have to be able to move ahead with your project unhindered. And so that's lesson number one, uh, the out clause. Make sure you have one. Doesn't matter who it is, make sure you have one. I think another mistake is writing for free. Mm -hmm. I think that is a mistake and not for the obvious reasons that you know you can't, you can't have a career as a screenwriter writing for free. Um, I think a lot of producers will ask you to write for free. And um, I think when they do, they subconsciously see that that is your value. Mm. And they will give you less priority. Yeah. And I don't blame them. Who, who, who screenplay would I be... Um, working harder to make happen. The one I've spent a hundred thousand dollars to develop or the one I have sitting over here that I got for nothing. I'm never going to get my hundred thousand dollars back if I don't make this movie. This one that I got for nothing is going to be there. And if he gets fed up, I'll go back to him in a year. He'll still be there. He sells scripts for nothing. Now that's not to say if somebody hasn't paid you money, already that you shouldn't continue to uh, support them and do what you can if they have a director and they don't really have a lot of development money and they want to pass done, you know, and you can work with the director. You want to stay in the, you want to stay in the creative circle. You, you want to be someone who is working with them in a way that's collaborative and positive. But if someone just comes to you out of the blue um, and wants you to do work um, on their screenplay, that is a huge no-no uh, for free because you don't own that underlying material and you could spend months working on this. It never happens. You never see a cent and, and you don't have anything to gain when you don't see a cent. In the typical uh, situation, you, you, you could do work on a script for a producer for free that you own and um, you get it back if he doesn't do anything and you've done your contract right. And you, so you own that work. It's not really free. You would have done it anyway with the good notes. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing work on his script for free or you're writing his story for free that he gave you, he still owns that story. You don't have any control over that story. So you're putting a lot of time into something he believes in. And um, you don't have any ownership in it. So if he just decides it's not worth the time of day, well, guess what? It's not. It's not going to see the light of day. You could use it as a sample, but you know, uh, we don't write these things to be used as samples. That's not the way we, you know, start out anyway. If, if it can be used as a sample to get you a job, great. But you know, ultimately, you want to have the control to to get that made. You've if you've done it right, you've poured your guts and heart and soul into that. You want it to see the light of day. You don't write these things for money. You write them so they end up on a screen. So, you, you know, that's, that's probably the second, the second and, and, and mistake. And there are, uh, there are situations where I would say, you know, there are exceptions to this, but there are few and far between when the producer owns the underlying material. Uh, it's usually only, you should only write something for free if, if it's yours and it's coming back to you regardless of what he does.
So, I mean, that, that I would say is probably the big, the big uh, no-no, the second no-no mm -hmm. for screenwriters. You save yourself so much frustration, yeah. you know. And I think uh, the third mistake you can make is, I addressed it earlier, relying on other people mm -hmm. uh, to get your material before cameras. I think if you if you see other people as sort of the gravy uh, and you're the potatoes, you, you have to go and do this yourself, you know, and, and if they help, that's great. That's great. And if they say they're going to help you and they really are trying, that's, that's wonderful. Maybe you'll find an ally for 20 movies, but don't count on it. Don't count on it. I, I am constantly, I spend about three quarters of my day writing, but a quarter of my day is spent um, pushing my projects with producers, with agents, with actors, with directors. It's, it's really a business, um, just like any other business. Th this isn't a place you go just, just so you don't have to go to the same office every day. This is, this is a business. This is, you have an office you go to every day. It's, you know, right there. I don't care if you're in your car, sitting at the beach, sitting on the toilet. I don't care where you are. You should always be writing. You know, it is, it is something that is, uh, has to become so much a part of you that, um, you know, you do it all the time. There are piles of paper beside my bed from notes. I've woken up in the middle of the night and scribbled them down and some I can't read, unfortunately, because I know they were my best stuff, but <laughs> <laughs> the point is, you know, you have to treat this like a business. You know, there's an old saying, you know, half of show business is business, right? I mean, it's the old saying and it's so true. Keep records of who you meet, you know, say hello on the holidays. Um, you know, keep detailed records. I met him and you will think, oh, I could never forget that this is when I went in there with this director and he said this or that. No, write that on their business card and keep it. Or write that on the calendar with their name and what they said and, and refer to something very specifically. Uh, if they love race cars and they talked about it, put it down because I promise you three years from now, you will not remember that. Um, so, you know, treat it like a business treat it like a business. And um, you've got a source with IMDb Pro. It's worth, I think it's $100, $150 a year. There's no better way to, sorry about the light, it's getting dark here already. Um, <laughs> <Just there's, thinking. laughs> there's no better way to um, access a lot of these people. And, and yeah, you'll get the rejections, you'll get the 49 no's, but one of the, one of the 50 says, yeah, send it. Yeah. That's all you need is one, you know, one guy gets the ball rolling and excuse me. There's a little bit of light. Uh, one guy, one guy, that's all you need to get the ball rolling. And, and, and listen, one, one introduces you to another and he says, Hey, you know, I really like your writing, but uh, you know, anybody with a horror script? Yeah, I do. Actually. I just wrote one. Wow send it over. And, you know, he may say no, but he hands it to his friend or he has you in his brain now because he's read your material. So we kind of keep an eye on him. What are you up to these days? What are you looking for? I'd like to do a sports film. Oh, really? Well, I don't have a sports film, but I know this great sports story because that's another thing you should do as you read, as you read, you should write down great stories, put the email, Put in your, put an email to yourself about this particular story, or you know, keep keep the the uh, internet address, the URL, keep it, and file them. Treat it just like a business. It's no different than a real estate lead. You know, you just have to be ready for anything. Mm -hmm. And um, always working, even when you're not. Yeah. Yeah. Always not. Yeah. Always thoughts, like you said, waking up and putting down things. Well, it's shocking how much you 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 can't figure something out when you're looking at the page, and then and then 
because that's in your brain, it just comes to you in the shower. It just comes to you when you're, when you're in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. I always have, I have so many of these very tiny little that I keep in my jacket. Um, (laughs) You won't remember it if you don't write it down. Yeah, I don't, I don't at least. (laughs) And I never have. Yeah. I know my memory is not failing because I know when I was 30, I couldn't, I had, you would wake up, (laughs) you wake up with the greatest idea you ever had. And it's gone. An hour later, it's gone. You know, you go back to sleep and you didn't write it down. Yeah. Gone. And you're thinking, it's such a great joke. I'm definitely going to remember it. Oh, my gosh. This is it. Uh, the one. No. All the time. Happens to me all the time. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I know, that's like the best advice to always jot things down. Yeah. yeah. You, true. You're happy that you did. You know, <laughs> so true. those are probably the three, the three yeah. mistakes. Uh, not paying close enough attention. Mm-hmm. to who I was meeting. And I met a lot of people who I, I, you know, and I will remember, you know, I will see a film coming out. Then I'll remember, Oh yeah, I, I know him. What do I know him from? And it's so, sort of like, you, you don't have any way to reference it. So you can't really reach out. I didn't take proper notes at, at periods of time during periods of time when I just thought the writing was enough and also not attaching the wrong producer. And also, you know, being sure that if you do, you, you have the yeah. uh, ability to get your material back. Um, no matter who you attach and they'll understand they they know how it works if they're legitimate mm-hmm. um and if they don't understand then they're probably uh, it's up to no good uh and then um the third one was just um god this i have i could go all day with uh, mistakes not to make because you know it's helpful it, well, <laughs> it's, it's, a helpful. Life of, it's a life of mistakes you you really like i said you, you're gonna make them all yeah and maybe but some- sometimes you can learn from someone and avoid them. So your collection of mistakes is a little shorter. Right. So. <laughs> you know, if you understand that being a screenwriter, as alluring as it may sound creatively, is just as much a business as being um, a dry cleaner. It really is. You have to do, keep the books on the people you meet. You have to foster those relationships. You have to expand those relationships using your circle of friends. Mm -hmm. And um, you do that all while you are keeping your eye on the main ball of becoming a better writer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is ultimately all that's important. Because, you know, you can work many years until you get that moment where you step up to the plate. But if you haven't practiced your swing while you've been working at it, it doesn't matter. You're going to be starting over. So, um, you know, keep practicing your trade and becoming better and using the insights of those connections that you have to make you better keep studying. There are a multitude of books out there. Sid Field has great books. Uh, Linda Seeger. There's a lot of them. There are great books also on acting and directing. You should also Mm -hmm. kind of just get a fair understanding of because it will help you as a screenwriter more so sometimes than the screenwriting books. Once you learn the rules, if you want to expand your horizons as a writer, you you should learn the rules for the other trades that uh, operate around, you know, within your universe. So um, just learn as much as you can about every aspect of it. If you want to be a screenwriter, you'll become a better screenwriter. You'll be able to write characters which attract name actors. And ultimately, if you want bigger films made, those are the actors that have to say yes to you. If they don't, you, you will never, it's all business. Without those names to drive it, yeah. you won't get the financing. So that's, that's the most important part, yeah. you know, knowing that your screenplay holds up every possible way and can give that producer who believes in you or you as ultimately the producer, the ability to 
get a director or an actor to say yes, because they are the true parts of this that will trigger the financing and get you seen. Mm -hmm. To end this wonderful webinar. Yes. With so much great advice that I think is going to change a lot of career paths and really guide them in the right direction. That would be nice. Yeah. So thank you very much for that. So to end this fantastic masterclass, whom would you like to nominate to be our next speaker to also offer words of guidance to the aspiring actors, filmmakers? You know, I met a, a guy four or five years ago um, as a director. He actually he and his partner brought me back to acting for a minute uh, because they had seen some of the uh, work I'd done in some older films. And he wanted me to uh, play the lead in this small film, which I did with uh, Amy Redford, who was uh, Robert Redford, the great actor's daughter. And uh, she and I played husband and wife who uh, in the few hours before they were sending our son to the electric chair and the few hours after struggled to figure out what was going to become of our marriage. And it largely uh, involved the fact that she had embraced him as a uh, homosexual and I had not. And uh, my coming to terms with uh, my implicit pardon where he had ended up. And this director uh, taught and uh, maybe still teaches at Loyola mm -hmm. and um, teaches screenwriting and directing at uh, Loyola in Louisiana, mm -hmm. New Orleans, and uh, lives there. And being that he is so intelligent on all aspects of filmmaking, but really in directing and screenwriting, um, and possibly could give you more insight on the point of view of a director in the screenwriting process. Um, I think he would be great. His name is Stephen Esteb. Wonderful. And uh, yeah, I think I think he could be he could be tremendously uh, um, helpful to to people just really wanting to know how to go about this. He he could also you might want to tailor your questions to him about the fact that. He lives in one of those tax states, and this is something I never brought up, but um, he lives in uh, Louisiana, which is with Georgia and New Mexico and a few others, one of the most attractive states to shoot a film because they give you uh, tax incentives to shoot there. And uh, that could be another uh, bit of helpful information, which would guide screenwriters toward writing things which can be shot in those places you know and they are naturally shot there they're perfect for that environment because you know this is something producers will look at um sometimes as much as your screenplay mm -hmm. because you know i mean it's again it's still the film business and that's that's free money yeah. that's really where a lot of the short coming of your budget may be made up and it could be the difference between getting made and not getting made. So um, I think he would be a good one to talk to. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's what we're trying to explain how important film tax credits are to Pennsylvania because so many amazing filmmakers are ready <laughs> to come and film because we have so much to offer in terms of locations and crew and cast and just it's, it's a beautiful state to film at. But we need to explain <laughs> why this film taxes are so important for that. Well, he can he can do that for you because I'm looking forward to having that discussion about the film tax credit. So thank you very much. That's a wonderful nomination. I'm excited to meet him. And yes. Kevin, you have been so helpful, and you you just share such interesting perspectives on things that you really don't think about when you're just starting out. So thank you very much for sharing your wisdom for being so honest about everything. So my, it's my pleasure. And I will, I will end by saying, um, you know, there's no real rules here. That's the disclaimer. You can throw everything I said out the window ultimately, but uh, in my experience, um, some of these things has served me. They've served me well. 
Um, but everyone has their own unique experience. It is still an art. Um, and, um, you know, just if you stay truth to your heart, you, you know, you can rarely go wrong, even if the business side of it isn't working as well as you'd like. Um, I have found that those who do usually end up not only better people for it, but also more successful because they, they were authentic in their beliefs and in and, and, and their uh, soul with what they were trying to put forward. And sometimes it takes longer to take the high road, you know, <laughs> but uh, it's important. It's important for you. It's not just about becoming a screenwriter. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Kevin. You're amazing and we're immensely grateful. And good luck to everyone who's been watching. And we hope to see your films on the big screens one day, very soon. <laughs>